Professor Robin Batterham is one of Australia's leading scientists, indeed one of the globe's most respected scientists. He served as the Chief Scientist of Australia, a very prestigious and important position, for six years between 1999 and 2005. In that role, of course, he advised the Australian Government on all matters associated with science, engineering and innovation. We came to know one another during that time and uh, my respect for you and your views is enormous. So I'm very thankful indeed we have this opportunity to talk. Um, before taking on the role of Australia's Chief Scientist, uh, Robin worked at mining giant Rio Tinto and at the CSIRO. He also worked as a Chief Scientist, in, as a scientist in the field of mineral and process engineering. He's now Kernow Professor at the University of Melbourne where his current areas of focus include understanding of what is really needed to get to net zero by 2050. And we'll talk a bit about that. Outside of the academy, uh, as I've touched on, you and I have worked together personally in an area that I think is very important and where we need to advance the science quickly so we really know what the opportunities are uh, to in the area of soil carbon sequestration a major part of the Australian government's um, technology roadway that they talk about. Uh, we need to know what it is and what's needed to make it happen and just how far its reach will be. Uh, but it's a very important area. We, we, it's one of the things we're going to talk about. So great privilege to be able to talk to you. And can I begin by saying, um, you are a serious scientist who needs to be taken seriously. And I just really love a feel from you as to how you see the whole debate about climate warming, um, human activity, uh, the contribution that it is making. I ask that because we're endlessly told there's a complete uh, consensus among scientists, and yet many of the tipping points that the activists tell us are going to happen have actually not happened or have not been as catastrophic as we were told. So we, we, I think many of us are still saying, can we get a really clear and authoritative steer on the science and on the modelling? I'd just be interested in your general views. John, a pleasure to chat on that topic uh, and others. And I might say, um, uh, thanks for that question. How long have we got? Uh, <laughs> you could go into a lot of detail. Um, let me just say something first about science and the role of uh, science, um, because I think a lot of people uh, get the idea that science sorts it out. We know what's right, what's wrong, uh, we can predict things, uh, etc. And of course, uh, to some extent, uh, that's absolutely right. Uh, there are some things that are pretty certain, which is if I looked at this table where we've got two glasses of water and I uh, tip the thing over, there's a pretty good chance that water's going to end up on the floor floor. Uh, there's not much of a chance, although it's theoretically possible, that it could all disappear out a crack uh, in the door over, over a few metres uh, away from us. So there are, of course, some things that are a lot more certain than others. But science at the end of the day isn't in the business of being right or wrong or truth or false or inconvenient truths or untruths uh, as the case may be. Science is about working hypotheses which we use in our daily lives to help understand, to help improve things and to help sometimes give us an indication of what's coming around the corner. And these working hypotheses if they're no longer fit for purpose, we just discard them and come up with another one. Newton had an apple supposedly fall on his head and figured out uh, some laws of uh, gravitation. Einstein came up with a relativity that really said, Newton, you've got it wrong, good sir. Uh, there's a lot more to it than that. It doesn't stop us even now using Newtonian physics to predict how something is going to fall if you drop it from the Leaning Tower of Pisa or what have you. And will it hit the ground at the same time? Will a stone ball hit the ground the same time as a glass ball or whatever? So we've got to put things into this context that when a chief medical officer or a scientist stands up and says, we're all agreed, this is where it's heading, 
draw air between teeth a little bit and say, well, just remember, you're basing that on hypotheses, which may or may not be particularly useful and may or may not get improved as we get more data and understanding. So this is a very long-winded way, by way of openers, of saying this is never black and white. It is never solved, even if 999 out of 1,000 say, yep, that's where we're heading. So then when I come to the actual modelling of forward climate, I find that the modelling itself uh, tends to be the agreement between different models is somewhat all over the place, point one. Point two, if we go back to 1850 or so and look at CO2 just steadily rising, steadily rising, up and down every season, I might add, uh, of course, we know that, um, but also, uh, and visible, by the way, in the atmosphere. There is no doubt that you can measure the CO2 in the atmosphere that's come from fossil fuels. It's got a different isotopic uh, ratio uh, to CO2 that's up in the upper uh, atmosphere. So steadily rising, and yet temperature hasn't steadily risen. It's gone up. Level, down a bit, up, down a bit, up over 10 to 15 year type periods. Yet our driver has gone steadily up and our models say it goes steadily up, not up, down, up, pause, whatever. So there's something here in our modelling that should alert us to the fact that whilst we know a lot about it, and certainly our short term weather forecasting these days is very, very good, um, we're actually nowhere near the 100% level. So that being the case, I urge a little bit of caution about the alarmist side. If you're relying on the models only, your justification to me is not so strong. I'm not saying don't do anything. That's a very different uh, discussion. I find that valuable because no, you're not arguing and I'm not arguing for complacency. That's different. But if we... Or, or denial, John. Or uh, denial. We're not denying. No, no. No, no. As I said, you can measure fossil fuel CO2 in the atmosphere mm. and it is increasing. And there we know no too. And even, it has an impact. And even before that, in my field, in agriculture, farming practices have been releasing carbon we know for centuries. Um, and that's anthropological activity that's been releasing carbon. But the point is, we need to be calm and avoid catastrophism. Catastrophism rarely solves a problem, it seems to me. So we need to be measured and flexible and calm. I think there are so many ways that we can take a sane approach, a balanced approach, uh, we can say, because we don't know all of the detail of how the future will unfold, it behoves us for generations to come, even those living now, to tread carefully. And tread careful, treading carefully does mean making alterations. But should we go overboard on one particular brand A or brand B or one particular option. And that seems to me to be not a smart way to go because what we know is that if there's a broad will to make change, and we see that in Australia, we've signed on for zero by 2050, uh, both sides and all states, uh, et cetera, have done that. If we see that there's a broad will, it's pretty hard to say that any one particular path is going to get us there faster with less negative impacts as well as positive uh, impacts as others. So you actually do need a range of activities going on that will then deliver you to the path. And if you find that uh, the things that you choose to be your preferred paths are having no impact, uh, heaven forbid, but if that's what you find, well then of course you change the paths that you're on. But all I would remind, uh, not that you need reminding of it, John, um, innovation is path dependent. The more you get into something, the more you learn, the more opportunities open up and away you go. It's very, very hard to say, pick this path because I know and 999 out of a thousand also think they know. 
I take the point. And in terms of being active on a multiplicity of fronts, one of the things that I think we need to really try and get people to understand is that we'll make the task a lot easier if you can pull some of the, some of the uh, emissions that are out there back out of the system and put them away again. Uh, and so the term is net zero. And a lot of people think that this is all about generating electricity with no emissions and moving to transport systems with no emissions and what have you. The first problem, of course, is that feeding people will always involve carbon emissions, always. Uh, roughly at the moment, uh, I think agriculture is worryingly dependent on fossil fuel myself. I have for many, many years, worryingly. We're feeding vast numbers of people, doing it very well. The world's farmers are really doing an incredible job. But the amount of fossil fuel used is enormous. You're not going to be able to reduce that carbon to zero. You can't do it, those emissions, and still feed people. So we've got to find ways to offset. And part of that um, is, we think, uh, you and I have talked about it a lot, and that's why I'm so keen to hear your views put before as many people as possible, that there are real opportunities uh, to um, respond in part, in large part, a significant part potentially, uh, by absorbing and sequestering carbon. This is an interesting uh, topic. Um, there are a few points there, um, one of which is at the end of the day it's about net zero. Uh, you can have a plus here as long as you've got a minus there and the two uh, cancel out. But where net zero and offsets and sequestering I think got off to a bad start uh, was uh, some perhaps poor use of language or not fully appreciating that some people would see the notion of negative emissions and sequestering as just an excuse for not doing anything and letting the emitters keeping on as they are. So all of the debate, for example, around carbon capture and storage in geological formations, um, disused oil wells or uh, oil and gas uh, reservoirs and so forth, um, was just seen as a debate for allowing people to keep on burning uh, fossil uh, fuels. Right. Um, uh, we'll, uh, perhaps I'll come to the uh, soil uh, one in just a moment, but just to concentrate on this net and positive and negative um, uh, emissions. Um, it's a pity with uh, geological sequestration that the debate got very polarised into, well, look, uh, nobody's doing it much. Well, you know, there are 40 million plus tonne a year in the US being uh, sequestered of carbon uh, into the ground, and it's going into oil and gas fields. Uh, they're not really using saline aquifers yet. Um, because there's plenty of uh, capacity there to do it. So it's hardly an unproven uh, uh, technology. But you would need um, uh, not those sort of numbers, but 10 and 100 times those numbers to offset just continuing to burn fossil fuels. So that's not the answer. But there are some areas that we really can't see getting down to net zero. Um, the it's not up that I'm trying to avoid the agricultural one, John, I will get to it. Um, such as making cement. Uh, you know, when you burn limestone, calcium carbonate to get through to calcium oxide to go into the clinker, boom, where does the CO2 go? And nobody's figured out a way to really do that other than capturing it and putting it away geologically or reacting it with rock and building mountains of uh, waste rock uh, or whatever. Uh, similarly with aviation, while people are talking about electric and hydrogen powered aircraft, etc., I don't think we're going to see the world's aviation doing that by 2050. I think it's more likely that some areas and some long distance transport, you know, we're still going to need liquid fuels, thank you very much, and they will give CO2. So for all of those, we've got to have negatives somewhere to offset the positives that we can't bring down to zero. So turning to agriculture, um, the Green Revolution doesn't get talked much about these days, but the notion of uh, readily available fertiliser, um, um, proper uh, uh, and intensive, more and more intensive uh, farming, uh, and very selective uh, species. I mean, who grows long stalk wheat these days, uh, for example, because why do you want to put energy into uh, stalks when you can be putting it into grain and, and so on? 
By the way, the answer is if you live in a thatched cottage, as I did for a few years, you actually do need long grained uh, wheat to rethatch the roof every now and then. But that's just an aside. Coming back to the point, the agriculture that's come from the green revolutions in every country, uh, including developing uh, countries, are uh, uh, picking this up as such that we can sustain a population, I think, that's well above what you could do with less intense agriculture. Now, this is a bit of an alarm bell because the arable land or the land that's available to us, as we all know, particularly in a rather dry and can be dusty country uh, like Australia is actually limited. We're sort of using all of it uh, now. So can we get the emissions that are associated with transport of fuels to the farm, with uh, making the chemicals that are used as pesticides, weedicides, etc., cetera, um, and um, uh, the diesel um, uh, for machinery on the farm, uh, et cetera, uh, let alone the fertilizers themselves, can we get the emissions associated with that way, way down? And I think the answer is yes, we can. Um, the last thing that we want to do, uh, it just seems silly to me, is to turn around and say, well, buy up uh, farmland, plant it out with trees, sell the offsets, and everyone is uh, better off. The farmers can retire with a marvellous um, pile of money. Um, the offsets can get sold on the international uh, market, and that that's a pretty good way of uh, getting our down to net zero. But excuse me, what happens to the farm products, be they food, be they animal, uh, or be they um, a timber or what have you, um, that were going to be produced on that land? You've taken it out of action. We can't support the world's population by wholesale reforestation. There isn't the land to do it. We can change our farming practices so that we need part of which is about tree planting and riparian uh, uh, techniques, um, deeper rooted perennials, uh, a whole host of things which allow us actually to get away with less emissions. Why? Because we need less fertilizer, for example and less chemicals. Uh, and why? Because we're into no-till, so we're not using so much diesel um, uh, on the farm in any case. Um, our productivity, it's envisaged, can even go up rather than down. And the soil carbon, the carbon that we sequester in the soil, is a net negative. It's a, if you like, it's a positive offset. It counts against the overall emissions. Now, I don't think we know yet for Australia whether for pasture and rangelands, whether the amount that we can sequester into the soil by changing practices is going to be such a number, like pick a number higher than 30 million tonne a year, um, that uh, it can be, it can more than offset the existing agricultural emissions. Uh, I'm not quite convinced that um, the agricultural emissions in and of themselves can come down below zero, such that what's sequestered into the soil is then a net negative. I think at the moment, there are some estimates, which I put quite a bit of uh, confidence in, that say could be net negative, and that means the farms are selling zero emission products. Um, could be slightly positive, but it's not going to be a huge negative number. But we need net negative numbers. There's no doubt on that. We'll come back to that in a moment, because just before I did, um, on, on the, on the uh, net zero, remembering what you're saying about it being net, not just reductions, you've drawn our attention to the, the incredible work that was done by Princeton University in America. On, um, called Net Zero America, outlining the measures that would actually be required to achieve it. Can you give us a feel for those? Because you, you're doing the same thing. There's the same coming up for Australia. Because you've got to take people with you in a democracy. Actually, even the Chinese governments had to take people with them. Yeah. They were getting cold and losing their jobs. So China's um, you know, uh, increased its... Uh, coal production by, or is going to increase it, by 98 million tonnes, we're told, this year. 
So even they have to respond to people. And sometimes I think activists and people in the media misjudge the fact that political leaders can't let their people starve. They've got to take them with them, you know, or freeze or whatever it happens to be. So give us a feel for what net zero America looks like, because it's critically important that people know what this might actually mean and what you think it might look like for Australia, given the work you're doing there. Yeah, we do have a project on uh, Net Zero Australia, which is uh, following in the footsteps and indeed has uh, one of the principal investigators of Net Zero America uh, on the Australian team. So the Australian effort is actually joint with the University of Princeton, with Queensland University, Melbourne University and the NAUS group. Uh, so it, it's a pretty powerful team. But looking at what was done in North America, and looking at the traction that it's now got with both colours of uh, politics uh, in the USA, and that's saying something I might add, it's yes, just pretty hard age. to achieve. Um, looking at that, it's pretty interesting because what they did was start off by saying, okay, you've got to have some understanding of the demand side. Uh, you know, how much energy do people need? How much for transport? How much for heating their houses, uh, etc.? cetera? Uh, and you've got to be able, and how many more people will there be uh, and the like? And so you do actually have to sit down and do that for many, many regions, not down to postcode level, but uh, certainly down to, you know, say 10 regions per state of that sort of order if we're talking the US. Um, about 30 or 40 regions if we're talking um, uh, Australia. Uh, so that you've got on the demand side, perhaps a couple of scenarios. One where everybody just goes gangbusters on electrifying everything um, uh, that they can. And one where you still electrify an awful lot, but you still rely on liquids, uh, if you like, you still rely on molecules, be it gas, which ultimately will be hydrogen, um, or be it uh, liquid fuels, uh, if it's for aviation or what have you. So once you've built up a picture of what the main possibilities are there, you then turn around and say, how are we going to supply that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And of course, you start from where you are now. Um, with whatever the supply chains are, the natural gas, the coal, the wind, the solar that's already there and so on, and nuclear and anything else that uh, takes your uh, fancy. And then you let, you say, well, here's where we are now. Here's where our demand curve goes through to 2050. And we actually can't alter that. Uh, and you turn around and say, well, let's every five years or thereabouts, you can do it on a finer grid, let an economic optimizer, bring in whatever is economic, whatever is the best choice for that area. So if solar is cheaper than coal, and you've got a growth in energy demand in an area, bring in solar. But if coal's cheaper, bring in coal, and so it goes on. Um, by the way, uh, in short, it uh, doesn't bring in any new coal. It co closes coal down fairly quickly, but that's, Does a, it? that's, a, yeah, yeah, that's a separate, um, sep separate uh, detail. So you let the economic optimizer work out what the trajectories are on the supply side. And you allow on the supply side a few options. For example, you might say, we'll have for renewables, we'll say that you can put renewables in, pick a number, 30% faster than we have ever managed to do before. And that will be our renewables scenario. But then because some people reckon you can do 100% renewables, we'll have a look at what 100% renewables will look like. But remember that the main renewables one will be, let's say, 30% better than the country has ever achieved before. So it's not going to be a mild thing. It's going to spread the country uh, <clears throat> where it's appropriate. And then the final step in all of that is to turn around and say, that's fine, but that piece of land might currently be high value agricultural crops. Don't tell me you're going to color, cover that with a solar farm, otherwise we're not going to be able to supply enough food to feed the people. So for every, let's now come down to postcode size of land, you've got to say, what are the constraints on change? including changing farming practices, uh, might add, or building solar farms or wind farms uh, and the like. 
And this then allows you to say, well, we're going to switch from A to B. We're going to switch from food production on that area because it's a bit marginal to um, energy crops, uh, which will then get burnt and the carbon sequestered. So we've got to have carbon capture and storage. Uh, how many kilometres is it to where it's going to be injected? Where are the basins where we can inject it? Ah, so we've part of the infrastructure we've got to put in is not just transmitting electrons, it might be transmitting carbon dioxide for geological sequestration. It's down to that level of detail. Goodness. Now, nobody has ever done that before for a country in that level of detail. And what it shows is, to my way of thinking, really quite startling, because what it's showing is that you're going to have to put in an awful lot of renewables, whether it's dare I call it the normal renewable case, or the we're going to have all renewables, we're not going to have anything else uh, case. Uh, you will have, this is for the US, you will have wind farms that go hundreds of kilometres offshore. So you've got to have shipping lanes to come into your port because uh, you can't totally fill up offshore with wind farms. It's too hazardous uh, for shipping. And so it goes on. You're going to have solar um, almost wherever you can put it. Uh, and so it goes on. This is allowing for the fact that some land, it might be uh, too mountainous, it might be for the First Nations people such that they don't want to have uh, that land changed, uh, and they can have a very legitimate position of saying, and nor do they want to see wind turbines, for example, in particular uh, areas. Put all those limitations in, and then what you find is, firstly, you need every which way for decarbonisation that you can think of. And if nuclear uh, is allowable, you include that. Um, that's just one of the things. You need an awful lot of solar, an awful lot of wind. You have to build two, three or more times the transmission grid that you've got now. Just think of the investment uh, to do that. In terms of pipelines for CO2, you've got to build almost as much pipelining for CO2 sequestration as the totality of the US oil and gas industry now. Which is 30 or 40,000 kilometers, as I this understand This is an awful lot. And this is what comes out of doing the work rather than waving the arms and saying, it's all renewable, stupid. Well, the answer is yes, you can do it, but by the way, then you'll have eight times the size of the current grid, which is a tad more, as you might expect. So we're doing it for Australia, and I'll get into an awful lot of trouble if I uh, try and forward predict what the numbers are before we've done the sums. But I would say, on the one hand, if it weren't for our exports, Australia has got the land area of the US with an awful lot of wind and an awful lot of sun and only a fraction of the population and the industry. So common sense would tell you for Australia, it's not going to be as big a challenge as for the USA. That's just plain you know, common yeah. sense. But now let's look at the export side. Yes. The US has what, you know, eight, 10% of its GDP or less. So let's pick a number eight. I don't know, can't remember the exact figure, but it's not, it's under 10 as exports. That's not the case with Australia. Far from it, as we know. There's this body of agricultural exports, this body of mining uh, exports uh, and so on. And when you look at the emissions associated with our coal, with our natural gas, and the t if you want to get into tier three emissions, um, our iron ore, iron ore is a beauty, thousand million tonne a year of iron ore exported. Somebody somewhere in the world has got to convert it into steel. And for every tonne of iron ore, you're using a minimum of about 0.5 tonne of carbon, which is well over a tonne of uh, CO2, of course. So around the world, there's a billion tonne plus of CO2 being emitted because of our iron ore. And excuse me, that's just a little bit more than the whole of Australia put together about three times uh, over. So, and that's not counting our coal and our uh, LNG exports. So if you assume that by 2060, 2070 or so, the rest of the world isn't going to take LNG or coal, and that's what a lot of people in the marketplace are telling us, and it's what India and China are telling us, 
If you assume that, then what is Australia going to export that fits the economy, economic needs uh, of the country, but has net zero emissions? Now, a lot of people will say, oh, well, you know, we've got so much land, it'll all be solar and it'll make, uh, plus wind and it'll make hydrogen and we'll export that and everything is fine. And the answer is yes. So what we're doing in net zero Australia is we're tapering off coal and natural gas in the long run. And we are allowing exports to be pretty massive of low emission products. So we'll be able to point to where these could be cited, where are the jobs that are going to be lost, where are the jobs that are going to be gained. And this is the sort of detail that's going to bring home to people that sure there'll be more jobs in a net zero 2050 overall, but they're not the same jobs and they're not necessarily in the same areas. Well, there's certainly some challenges there. What assumptions, by the way, are made for... So you get to net zero by 2050, nominally speaking. You've used an incredible amount of energy and steel and coke and coal and... Coke and coal and what have you. Raw resources to build all those renewable energy sources, solar panels and what have you, uh, generators. Yeah. Then they've, over time, got to be replaced. It's a bit like farming. You're going to have to keep emitting, so you've still got to find sources to offset those emissions. It might be much reduced, but solar panels don't last forever. A lot of energy involved yeah. in making solar panels. So you do, you do end up in a position where uh, you've got to consider negative emissions as well as just emission uh, reduction. I think one can see the way through to um, almost net zero uh, or almost zero emission steel, for example. And there are those who are uh, heartily investing uh, in this area at the moment. Um, uh, Mr. Forrester, for example, uh, with the hydrogen based route through to uh, green steel. And I applaud uh, those activities. Um, BHP is back. Um, uh, some work at, um, in, the, in the States on high temperature electrolysis, which is looking quite promising, but it's still at the uh, fairly uh, small uh, scale. But as you point out, the, if the green steel is running off wind and solar, there's emissions that have gone into making those wind and solar farms. So you've got to have net you've still got to have net negative emissions somewhere along the line. And the ways for that are primarily through sunlight, photosynthesis, crops, use the crops uh, for source of energy, and you've got to put the uh, carbon away. So there's got to be negatives uh, in it somewhere. Otherwise, the equation is very, very difficult. Can't be made to work. Correct. Yeah. Um, part of uh, what I was thinking as you were talking there is that there's been increasing talk about how the business investing engineering communities will have to start to make this happen because governments can't on their own drive it. Uh, it, 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 it it's, it, it, it's interesting to look at the pace of change and say, uh, does it need more government intervention? Should we have a price on carbon and then let the market uh, sort itself out? Um, what's the road to implementation and does it need a helping hand? And there's a couple of ways of looking at this and saying, OK, if you look at the uh, Australian energy market operator and its forward projections in its integrated uh, power supply uh, plan, um, uh, I think the decarbonisation of the grid, and this is before Nadell uh, comes off, uh, the decarbonisation of the grid has exceeded the forward predictions of the rate of decarbonisation now for some years. And you look at that and say, wow, you know, this is the market talking. Uh, there's less energy demand, people have gone 
uh, and installed rooftop solar far faster than many other people thought they would, uh, etc. So the market is talking is why we're seeing this phenomena. But then the question is, your question really is, OK, is it enough to stand back and let the market do it? On the other hand, you can look at it and say um, there's the to be a bit impolite, uh, but I don't mean any disrespect, there's the entrails of a few prime ministers who brushed with carbon tax uh, laid out uh, in Canberra for all to see. Uh, tread lightly if you're going to use a blunt instrument like a carbon tax. Some would argue a carbon tax uh, is not a blunt instrument. I would argue uh, conversely. Uh, I would say that there are targeted interventions that are possible how much of them we need, I don't know, but there are targeted interventions that are possible that are far sharper than a carbon tax. Um, for example, um, mandating energy efficiency standards for buildings. Um, this is something you can say, oh, but it'll take 30 years or the building stock is even longer than that. And the answer is, yeah, but if you start today, uh, you're on a journey and where you go. Uh, you should not be able to buy a pane of glass in Bunnings or wherever you go to to get a pane of glass that isn't double glazed. You shouldn't be able to buy single pane glass, full stop, end of story. Um, a certain politician that mandated uh, that you can't use incandescent light bulbs actually got it right. Um, um, well, half right. Uh, it should have, en should have mandated an energy efficiency standard for light bulbs and not just said you can't use incandescence uh, anymore. But that's a, a minor point. So there are sharper tools and there are blunter tools. And it seems to me the smart thing to do is to bring on some of the sharper tools and see how they go. Because once you put tools into the marketplace and you provide incentives, watch how people very ingeniously make them work and learn to live with them, uh, I might add. So I think we do need some helping hands that the market on its own is not enough. And of course, the, the minimum tool that you need is a helping hand on technology, um, because the incentives to come up particularly with major improvements in technology, whether it's measuring soil carbon or whatever, the incentives to improve are not always there that are going to drive it through. So getting technology up onto a higher plane and getting some things from the early stage thinking and out into the marketplace, that needs a push. Now, talking of needing to get on with it, so you, you make the point about building. So set the standards now because it'll take a long time to come in. There's another area where I think you and I have talked a lot about this, but I think it's really worth exploring. Um, if a large part of the pathway forward is to sequester as the government implies in its, in its roadmap, uh, carbon in soils, we actually need to know what's in there and what is left in net terms after you've been through farming cycles. It's important to understand uh, for people who are not familiar with, with it that farmers are emitters of carbon as we go about the business of producing food and fibre, but we're users of carbon and we can absorb carbon. We're recyclers of carbon. Absolutely. There's a cycle there. Absolutely. Now, the big thing is that we need to be able to benchmark. Now, before we come to the mm. benchmark, though, you do a brilliant job of explaining to the lay people what soil carbon sequestration is. Mm. I, I think, I'm not sure about brilliant, but uh, thank you. Uh, I think the soil carbon thing uh, is interesting. Most of us are very conscious of anthropogenic emissions, and we can even spell the words uh, uh, and so on, uh, and even have some feel uh, for the numbers. Few people realise that the amount of carbon dioxide that gets pulled out of the air and goes into plants is many times that 
of anthropogenic emissions. It's just a much bigger number, and it's going on all the time, whether humans are running around or not, I might add. Um, but quite a bit of that carbon, which comes down into plants through the process of photosynthesis, actually gets back up into the atmosphere. But about 1% of it, or thereabouts, uh, you know, 0.8 to 1.2, it varies, uh, and so on, stays in the soil. And this can be magical. Um, how does it get down there? Well, we all know photosynthesis uh, is CO2 plus sunlight equals sugars, if you like, uh, to describe it simply. And that goes down and it provides the energy for the roots to grow, uh, for exudates on the roots, which fungi can pick up uh, as their feed supply and they can attach to minerals and solubilize it and feed it into the roots. And all these interconnected uh, systems, I mean, the complexity of it is just mind blowing, uh, really. Yet it all works. And the net net of all this, particularly when we consider the microbes that are in the soil, the bacteria, the fungi, and some larger critters, of course, as well, um, is that they are all feeding off each other and making products, some of which are the feed for other ones uh, and so on. And the net of it all is that some of that CO2, only a small amount, some of that CO2 ends up as various carbon products in the soil that can stay there. And if we're talking the top few centimetres of the soil, they mightn't last all that long. They go up and down with the season and whether it rains or not, and whether a fire goes through or a flood for that matter and makes it uh, you know, without oxygen anaerobic. Um, those that are deeper down though, start to be rather long lived. Um, and indeed, um, so I've read, I can't uh, guarantee it, uh, the average age of carbon in the soil down to a metre is 7,000 years. Really? So you dig down a metre into your farmland and you're disturbing 7,000 year old carbon. <laughs> so this is long lived stuff. If we haven't sorted out whether we're in deep trouble with climate change, whether we've made enough changes and got to zero carbon, et cetera, in 7,000 years, then you know we're in real trouble. <laughs> so I don't wanna to make too light of it. Yeah. The point that I'm making is that a small bit of that sunlight plus water, of course, if you don't have water, you can't get carbon uh, in the soil. Um, and that's important. I'll come back to that if I may. A small bit of it is ending up in the soil and staying there for a long period of time. There's a wonderful experiment in the UK that's, uh, and many, many experiments in other parts of the world. The UK one's 170 years plus uh, old that it's been going. There are plenty in the world that have been going 30 and even 50 years, where you take field A with farming method A, mm. same terrain, field B with a different method, and you just keep measuring how they perform. And if field B does better than field A in terms of productivity, it tells you something about your farming methods. The one that I refer to in uh, the UK, uh, one field had organic material brought back onto it from animals, and the other field didn't. And it just outperformed for 170 plus years. And the soil carbon is much higher. And when the soil carbon is higher, you retain more moisture in the soil. When it does rain, and this is so important for Australia, you hold more of it. It gives you more drought resilience. It doesn't drought proof the place. You go five years without rain, the amount of carbon in the top part of the soil pfft, ain't much there. Uh, some of the uh, microbes and things go into senescence and they'll you know, be there for, for centuries, I think in some particular uh, cases. So soil carbon, long-lived and beneficial to get it higher rather than lower. It, it's a marvellous formula, but how do you measure it? Oh, not easy. Even before we get to that, let's explore this win-win for a moment because we've still got people sort of saying, oh, you know, this technology roadmap, and, and, and I'm not talking about farmers here, I'm talking about even, you know, senior members of the community and, and, and politics who are worried that if, if, if part of the pathway is 
soil carbon, it means locking country up. Whereas in reality, what yeah. we're talking about here is making existing land perform differently. There's a couple of things to explore. We know that agriculture, it releases carbon, and particularly over the centuries, I made that comment earlier, pre-industrial revolution for a lot longer, further back than that, turning soil over, ploughing it, to grow crops has released a great deal of that carbon out of the soil, vast quantities. Yep. For example, in Queensland, we know vast quantities. Uh, and so it's, it's, too, it's double edged, isn't it? You, you know, some yeah. soil management practices release a lot of, of carbon, uh, but it can be altered. It, I mean, there, yeah, I mean, this is spot on. Uh, it's quite clearly that intensive agriculture uh, which has been practiced for some time in quite a bit of Australia now, in pasture and in uh, range in um, cropping, um, tends to drive carbon down over perhaps a 50-year period, uh, depending on the soil and the practice, etc. It can uh, plateau. Um, if you return the practice to something. Um, which uh, perhaps rotates uh, animals and uh, crops, uh, zero till, um, rotational grazing uh, and the like. Um, there are practices that can improve the soil carbon. Uh, you could also just walk away from the land and let it return to whatever the native vegetation uh, was with or without regular cold burning a, a don't want to enter that as an argument as to what state do you return to. The point is that you could stop using it as agricultural land and you would in general get an increase in the soil carbon naturally by revegetation. However, uh, let's stay with the productive agriculture. Then whether you come back up to what the land was 50 years or 100 years uh, or so uh, earlier, um, or whether you can exceed it, actually. Um, some people uh, will debate uh, that one, but it's certainly going to be higher than where it is now. So we've got, I think, for the next 50 years, an opportunity to come back up to considerably mm. higher levels. And it's pretty indisputable because you could do it by stop being a food bowl for so much of the world and let them look after themselves. And uh, we'll just stand back and revegetate a lot of it. Um, and then we know that that will bring the carbon up. But I think that we can do the productive agriculture and at the same time be building up carbon in the soils. Because we do know, uh, for example, that um, uh, a unit of carbon will help that soil in, in the soil will help that soil absorb, I think it's six times by weight volume, the amount of water uh, for yep. each unit of carbon, which is pretty amazing. That's, that's your drought proofing remark. This, this, or not drought proofing, yeah. but you know, it, 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 it provides much more resilience in, I mean, in this there, tough season. There's some work that suggests that um, not only is it about uh, some of the products of the microbiome, the small animals that live in the, uh, the soil, not only is it about them and the wetting of the soil, but they affect the porosity of the soil, how much water can get into it uh, in the first place. They expect the livelihood for things that creep and crawl and worms and the like, uh, etc., that are going to turn the soil um, uh, over and do some of the work uh, for you. So the higher the carbon, the more of this activity, hence the sort of numbers that you quoted and that you see quoted, and you can see field trials uh, for this, where the water retention is just so much higher than it is with lower carbon uh, levels. And there are, of course, some fairly easy demonstrations of that. But the interesting thing with that one, where I think the jury is, well, let's not call it a jury, where we need a lot more observation, is that you can also be altering the microclimate, um, and then that affects actually how much uh, evaporation there is, and hence, ultimately, uh, in some areas, some people would argue how much uh, dew you will get deposited at night and so forth because the ground temperature is then different and the small scale humidity is different. I, I'm not sure that the amount of rainfall that you get in an area 
uh, is so dependent. Um, the wind has a marvelous uh, way of moving weather systems uh, that you might have generated or local conditions that you've generated onto your neighbor's property, thank you very much. Um, but certainly at this micro atmosphere level and the sort of day night uh, uh, side of things, yes, so you can benefit from having higher carbon levels giving you more water retention, giving you more water kept, even from evaporation um, uh, through the day. So, you know, there can be some definite pluses here for farmers. So, uh, it might be over and above that, that given that carbon is very important in food production, it'll help us develop denser, more nutritious foods. It's been surprising for me to learn that particularly in Europe, uh, and particularly since the end of the Second World War, soils are finally starting to fade a little and part of the story is carbon loss uh, and we've been breeding for rapid growth particularly a hungry europe in the 1940s and 50s after the war uh, and some of our foods particularly vegetables are less dense and less nutritious in fact there's an opportunity here to restore that to give people better food the marketing edge for farmers would be quite surprising now yep let's come to the really interesting crunch that that you and i have been frankly um, very uh, focused on for quite some time. All of this is all very well, but you've got to have a user-friendly, affordable, reliable, trusted system for measuring. And a lot of progress has been made, but it's still very expensive, very cumbersome. Farmers don't know how to access it. I was talking to a farmer who uh, uh, knew that I was going to have this conversation with you, and he said, I'm really interested, but give us an idea of how we get on the information train and understand this stuff. But, um, uh, and, and uh, you know, yours and my friend Terry McCosker, and I've had a conversation with him in this series on our own farm about this, has a carbon link, as he calls it, and he's getting closer and closer to being able to uh, do a reasonably affordable and accurate mm -hmm. job. We've seen sales to uh, American uh, computer companies uh, of uh, carbon credits on Australian land. But it's still, you know, if people say we need it $3 a hectare and quick and easy to use. And the longer we tarry, the more farmers who are starting to do really good things with it and interesting things in their soil, they're going to miss out. And what's yeah. more, Australia will miss out yeah. because we will have made progress in absorbed carbon that's not being credited to us. Yeah. This issue of measurement, which uh, you've been really on to, can we talk about that for a minute? Yeah, let, let's um, kick measurement around a bit. I mean, measurement, uh, there's an old adage, you know, what gets measured gets done. Uh, yeah. um, and one of the things on farms uh, at the moment is um, if everyone has a rain gauge or at least access uh, to them. Uh, you know what your rain uh, is doing and you know it uh, you know, on a daily, whenever you read it, or weekly uh, uh, sort of basis. Um, but we don't have, you don't know how much of it is being uh, held in the soil, I might add, but that's another thing. Um, uh, a lot of people now measure soil moisture uh, just routinely and they have their fields instrumented uh, for that. Um, so this is part of the notion that if you measure it, then you've got a chance to do something about it. Mm. Now, the trouble with, uh, as you've alluded to, or spelt it out actually very clearly, the trouble with the carbon measurement is that, okay, there are a lot of offerings in the marketplace. Uh, they're not necessarily certifiable. They're not necessarily uh, easy to use. We've got a gold standard certifiable system, but it's expensive. So we've got to get the costs of that down. And there are essentially... That, that's the standard the government has set. Yes. If, if, you're, if a farmer is to say, I want to sell credits. Correct. Uh, Correct. Uh, and, and, and I've got to have evidence yep. that somebody can reliably uh, uh, take before yep. they fork out money for what I've done. Exactly. We've set a very high standard in we, this country. We have indeed, and I don't argue against that. And I don't there's, argue against it either. There's nothing wrong with having the gold standard for the world uh, whatsoever. Ultimately, uh, we have to have very high standards in that area, because if you have a low standard, then anyone, as happened in Alberta, I think, uh, some while ago, can just say, well, I'm going to change, I'm going to move to no-till. Therefore, you owe me X, where X is a very big number, thank you very much. And then a couple of years later, you might turn around and say, gee, that didn't do too well on weed control. I'm going to go back to tilling uh, or, or whatever, as the uh, case may be. So nothing wrong with the gold standard at all. But we've got to get the cost down. 
And as I see it, there are three ways, if I may uh, just sort of quickly run through them. One is to start with something which is intrinsically low cost. That's remote, that's satellites. Mm -hmm. But satellites don't measure what's in the soil. They measure plant properties. By the way, if it's bare soil, you can get carbon in the top a few centimetres from a satellite. But who the heck wants to run their farm with bare soil all the time? You know, that's just not practical. So well, it's, it's not good practice either. <laughs> remote, we'll just wait till the wind blows. Um, the remote measurement is one way of going about it. That's method number one. And I'll come back to that one because I think that's a key one. Method number two is uh, some terrific stuff that Syro and others around the world have kicked off and Terry McCosker uh, has picked up. Uh, on and full marks to him, which is to say, look, we know we have to take a lot of samples to get accurate uh, measurements and get them down to depth. So we'll automate the sampling process and we'll automate the scanning of these cores that we pull out. Uh, we'll use one method perhaps for carbon and for hydrogen or perhaps moisture as well, and one method for the density of them because it's carbon per tonne that you want to get uh, at the end of the day. And uh, there's been terrific work done on that, both in the States um, uh, and here, um, that you still got to go out and take a whole pile of uh, samples. Now you can combine remote with that uh, to help you choose where you're going to take the samples by knocking out some areas that aren't going to give you the right statistics, uh, I might add, so that you qualify. But I look at that and say, no, 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 actually, what we're after, the real first prize is something which can do any terrain in Australia. Uh, and not have to knock bits of it out to get the statistics right or whatever. The third method um, has been used overseas, and there are people interested in it here, is to come along with a neutron generator, and that's not a dirty word, but it uh, don't stand underneath it or um, be... Uh, take proper safety precautions, because it's a non-contact thing. You can hold it above the soil, zap down with some neutrons from your neutron generator, and these are relatively cheap uh, these days, and then you wait for the prompt gamma ray uh, to come off and you measure them. Uh, and it might take you seconds, it might take you a minute or so, and that gives you soil all the way down to about a metre or so, which is limited by the prompt gammas uh, coming back up. And so you drive around in your truck, stop the tractor, whatever, with this mounted on the back, then go to the next bit, then the next bit. You can do thousands of measurements. But of course, you have no idea as to whether they're, well, not much of an idea, sorry, I shouldn't say no idea, uh, not a good enough idea as to whether that carbon was in the top centimetres or the bottom down near the metre or what have you. And in terms of changing farming practices, you've actually got to know that. You've got to know where the carbon is. Do you have to change out the species that you're planting for something that's deeper rooted that in your particular strata is going to take the roots down further and have more chance of keeping the carbon. So this brings me to the point of saying it's not just about getting the cost of calculating carbon and where it is down. You've got to be able to present the information to the people who are working the land such that they can use it and not on a five yearly basis when it's audit time for your ERF if you're registered under the ERF, but as a minimum year by year. And there's nothing wrong with having in your mind the prize of saying, why can't we have it like rain gauges? Now, I don't think we can get quite to the carbon like rain gauges uh, within a couple of years. Uh, longer term, yes. But I think within a couple of years, by using remote measurement and then limited sampling, and not just the sort of thing that um, Terry McCosker is doing, which I applaud and just have applauded, but some key measurements of the soil biome. It's these little creatures that are doing the work that's making the carbon stay there. And it turns out that if we can measure the functionality by taking some key measurements from the soil, we can then use that, if you like, as a lens, a prism in our machine learning, big data algorithms from the remote sensing. And that to me is there, bingo, you have it. Now, finding people who will package that up, so that's the R&D. Um, please send a check in the mail or whatever, but that doesn't <laughs> happen these days. Um, 
finding the people who will then package this up and make it presentable at reasonable price so that people who are operating the land, be they large corporations, people who've lived on the land for generations, uh, or e even be they peri-urban uh, people who actually quite often do a darn good job of maintaining their fences and a few other things and a few horses for the teenagers uh, and so on. So that all of those can use these results to manage what they're doing and, if it's certifiable, get paid for the carbon that they're locking up. I think this is eminently doable. Um, we're putting our hand up when I say we, uh, Melbourne University, with free, free ad, um, with uh, a bunch of um, potential collaborators for a, a quick feasibility for the round that the government has recently announced uh, in this area. Um, because I think we've got a methodology that gets through the jungle to cheap, certifiable, usable, meaning user-friendly measurement. Let's hope that there's some people inspired <coughs> by this conversation to help provide us with that push. Robin, John, thanks for thanks, your time. You've been thank, very generous. Thanks for the opportunity to toss around uh, um, a topic uh, that's very dear to my heart and one which I believe we can really make a difference. Well, so do I. So thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you for watching this episode. We appreciate your support. If you value vital conversations like this one, be sure to subscribe to the channel there and also click the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases.